I'm Caroline Hyde. Welcome to Bluebird Triple Take, where we have one key topic. We split it into three unique angles. And today, focus on travel. Fresh off the July 4th weekend, we dig into the various angles that are putting stress on global transportation system. Over the next past few days, of course, more than 12 million people passed through US airports. Taylor was one of them. And they faced higher prices, thousands of delays, persistent shortage of pilots. The travel chaos also gripping Europe, sending one company into bankruptcy. Taylor, high demand, various issues on the supply side. A lot of a headache. How was your transfer? I have to admit, fingers crossed, double fingers crossed, I had no issues this weekend, but I know, of <laughs> course, a lot of people did. So really seems hit or miss, and all just about how the airlines are handling all of these different issues. Caroline, I think you've really set us up nicely in the introduction. We have, of course, our three different takes that we want to do about that holiday surge. Are we back to pandemic levels? How are some of the airline stocks doing as we're nowhere near to some of those pre-pandemic levels that we've seen in the actual equity price? Of course, the labor strike that's coming into all of this. We've talked a lot about the pilots, the staffing, the shortages, how sort of all of these um, airline associations, if you will, the pilot associations, you name it, handling all of this. Let's get back to some of the first take here that we wanted to do. This is, of course, some of those commercial flights, right? Back to pre-pandemic levels, Caroline. Are we? Almost. In terms of where we are, we're back to, well, right? March, sort of February 2020, mm -hmm. right before the big drop off. But we really need to see sort of that sustained rebound, not just on some of these holiday weekends, but more on a consistent basis, I imagine. And whether they can face some of the price hikes that we've seen. George Ferguson, I'm pleased to say, from Bloomberg Intelligence is here to dissect really how much the consumer can weather these disruptions and weather the price points too. So thanks for having me on. Yeah, we're uh, very concerned as uh, summer ends that the consumer will will hold up at these levels, right? We see uh, a lot of budget pressures, uh, you know, in their home budgets, fuel prices much higher to drive their vehicles, uh, energy prices, you know, utilities uh, costs are going up, food costs are way up. And so we think that combined with much higher ticket prices mean come fall, we'll see a lot less demand. I think there's a bounce back going on right now. People that want to get out and travel because they've been locked down during the pandemic. Uh, and again, I think it'll be hard for them to, to sustain as we get into the fall if we stay at these ticket prices. And that's that's a thing too that's not for sure, right? We saw oil come off pretty, uh, pretty dramatically today. Mm -hmm. If we continue to see oil prices come down, ticket prices will come down as well. And George, break down how you see demand splintering from here, if it does. I mean, does that mean those high ticket prices, maybe less demand for international travel, travel or maybe consumers pulling back on domestic travel? So we think it'll be across the board. Now, uh, you know, I'll say that international is starting to come back now on less restrictions, so probably uh, less aggressively come off on international. We see business continuing to come back, right? Business is at 75% or so, we think, of what it was in 2019 in May. Uh, so that continues to feather in, although it may feather in slower because of the higher, the higher ticket prices and companies manage margins. But in May, what we saw very interestingly was year over year, uh, consumers booking at online travel agencies were down 10% from the year prior, and even as ticket prices were, were much higher. So we think that's a sign that the consumer is starting to capitulate. And it's starting, of course, at that, uh, I call that the most price sensitive consumer, the online travel agency uh, consumer. How are you thinking about further consolidation in this space as well? Yeah, so we, you know, we think there's not a lot of room. I don't think justice would allow some of the big players in the business to consolidate. Uh, you know, we do think that uh, transactions like, uh, you know, the Spirit Air Airline fight we have now between JetBlue and Frontier, we don't see either party have a problem problem getting that transaction done. So some of the smaller airlines could absolutely, uh, you know, converge, but we don't think. Justice would want a significant amount of concentration uh, from here in the industry. So that kind of keeps the big players out of that uh, out of that game right now. And George, just remind us of how global all these issues are. Also, I mean, interestingly, yes, uh, we're seeing pilots uh, strike or go for large, you know, pretty decent pay raises, uh, both in the Europe and the U.S. 
the, the consumer is under pressure, the budget's under pressure in both Europe and the US. In Asia, we're, they're still sort of re-emerging from the, from the pandemic and lockdowns, China's you know, sort of reinitiated lockdowns and that's really slowed down the recovery in that market. Mm -hmm. So really the best two markets have been the US and Europe and they're really experiencing the, the same effects right now, you know, higher costs, uh, higher ticket prices, consumer fading a bit. Uh, they both have very similar challenges. George Ferguson, it's always great to catch up with you. Thank you from Bloomberg Intelligence. We now move on to our second take, where we're going to look a little closer at airline stocks specifically. With us is Helene Becker, friend of the show from Cowan & Company, where she is Managing Director and Senior Research Analyst, covers airlines, air freight, aircraft, leasing. And which of your companies, Helene, are surviving the fittest at the moment? Which are the best place for what seems to be just torrid times from a supply side? Yeah, thanks for um, the question. So we think that the companies that are doing the best are not necessarily the stocks that are doing the best. Um, Southwest and Alaska are the only two in our coverage universe that hedge jet fuel. And obviously with jet fuel so volatile, they've actually had a huge benefit in the past quarter. And they're in a position to um, continue to benefit from that, those hedge positions going into the second half of the year. And then international travel, um, I'm not sure how to think about that. Mm. For a while, we were thinking international would carry the day in the fall. And um, with all the strengths that are going on, air traffic control, mm -hmm. um, personnel, there are a lot of disruptions. And it's, it's so different in Europe than it is in the U.S. In the U.S., you cannot have these wildcat type strikes that you've seen in Europe over the past couple of weeks. Um, and so we're not that worried here. But international travel should um, carry the day, especially international business travel. Mm -hmm. Since you don't have to test to come back to the U.S., those um, trips that business people may have been putting off, you know, may look more attractive in the fall. I'm curious about debt levels coming out of the pandemic as we think about our fixed budget, a proportion of the revenue now going to some higher fuel costs if you're not hedging those. What does that mean for the percent of your budget or your revenue that's now going off to pay off some of the big debt burdens that are still left over from the pandemic? So the balance sheets are so different now than they were mm -hmm. pre-pandemic. The cash positions are so high. And the airlines pay back the government in most cases that the money that they had borrowed to survive 2020, um, but they haven't really adjusted the cash side of the equation, and they don't want to because the um, the changes in the rules have been so, I guess volatile is maybe the right word to use. Sometimes you have restrictions, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you have high fuel prices, sometimes you don't. And obviously labor costs are going up. Um, it'll be interesting to see what United's pilots decide to do. Um, they were given an industry leading contract. The Master Executive Council recommended that the rank and file approve it. It was an average 14.5% increase over the next two years. And then American came in and offered their pilots almost 17% by 2024. And now the United pilots are thinking, well, maybe our contract doesn't look so good. So mm. it'll be interesting to see what happens. But a lot of inflationary cost pressure for the industry, and they're not using those cash balances to do anything other than bolster the balance sheet in case there's mm -hmm. another mega downturn. And Helene, when you break apart those inflationary pressures caught my ear rather that uh, to hear that of your coverage universe, only Southwest and Alaska hedge their fuel costs. When you look at the rest of your universe, I mean, what is the bigger issue here? Is it staffing shortages or is it those really, really high fuel costs? It's, can I say both? Can I be the typical analyst and say both? <laughs> if you back it up, yeah. <laughs> So on the on the labor cost side or the staffing issues rather, um, the airline industry was really surprised, right, that um, so many people that they asked to take temporary or voluntary leaves decided to make them permanent and find other jobs in other industry sectors. Um, it takes at least five years to become a full-fledged pilot to get those hours necessary. So that is not going to be solved in the short term. And then in terms of the recovery, um, we had thought it would take two to five years. It's taking two years. And I think the airlines were surprised at the strength of the recovery. And then on 
the fuel side, you have the war in Ukraine that and, and demand, right? You have a strong economy earlier this year. And as George pointed out, now you have maybe some concerns by consumers, and maybe you have a, a weaker economy or not as strong, and um, fuel costs will, will decline, and that would be beneficial. But airlines, you may recall that in 2014, 2015 had been hedging, and then when oil prices dropped so dramatically from 147 to 37 and then kind of settled down at 50, they were left holding the bag on, on billions of dollars of out-of-the-money hedges at significantly higher prices and almost went bankrupt because of that. So the industry moved away from hedging mm -hmm. in general um, to, to maintain their... their um, and, and then to maintain their cash positions, A, and then B, to adjust um, fuel, fuel costs through demand and price on the, on the revenue side. How are you thinking about future margin compression if you're locking in these higher costs from some of these contracts that you just mentioned? But if we do get a recession and you see a drop in revenue, what margin compression are you forecasting? Right. So we think there's margin compression from, I guess, three or four sources. So if, if we have a recession, and we're not forecasting that, but if we do, mm -hmm. then fuel prices would come down. So that would be a positive. Um, labor costs, we don't think are coming down that rapidly, especially because the airlines not only have to attract, they have to retain. So if, you're, if your starting salaries are going up, your, your mid-level salaries have to go up as well. So definitely salary pressure, and that's about 35, 40% of cost. Fuel is another 30, 35% of cost. So that's going up. Um, the good news is airlines are replacing older aircraft with younger, more fuel efficient aircraft. So you do get um, about a 15% benefit from the use of the 737 MAX or the A320neo family aircraft. So that's a good offset. Um, airport mm -hmm. costs are going up, though, so that's pressure. Maintenance costs are going up. Nobody ever talks about maintenance, um, a shortage of mechanics on the maintenance side, but right. that's true, too. So maintenance costs are going up. Um, and then to your earlier question, um, the balance sheets are still stressed, so interest expense is really high. We're talking mm -hmm. for the big three, over a billion dollars annually in interest expense, and, and that obviously puts pressure on that income margin. Mm -hmm. Really appreciate it. Very good income statement to balance sheet analysis. As always, Helene Becker, of course, from Cowan. And Caroline, we go over to you as we have further breaking news out of your UK. Yeah, once again, the cabinet secretary is being appointed after those two key resignations earlier today. Nadim Zahawi is going to be appointed as UK Chancellor to the Exchequer. He was pre previously serving as Secretary of Education, a man who is Iraqi born and indeed built a business over in the UK, a internet led business, but has been a politician for Stratford and Avon since 2010. So, a new Chancellor of the Exchequer for the United Kingdom. Plenty upon us in terms of political news, but we're getting back to the travel news in a moment. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. This is Triple Take on Bloomberg. Today, of course, we're focused on travel. So far, we've discussed some of the recent chaos at the various airports, especially in the U.S. and Europe. Plus, of course, we talked about how that's affected some of the airline stocks. Now to our third take, Caroline, the labor issue, and that helped to drive one airline, of course, into bankruptcy. Just today, filing for Chapter 11 is SAS, of course. This Nordic airline after pilot strike grounded a majority of the Scandinavian Airlines flights. I'm looking really at what is a European dashboard here for you? Because as we said with, of course, George Ferguson, this is a global story. And we're seeing, of course, some of the energy price pressures really being front and center over in Europe as they are far more attuned to what's happening with the Russia-Ukraine war. So Lufthansa are top of, top of the pack, unfortunately, in terms of fuel costs, labor costs. That's the German uh, airline overall. Lufthansa really having to deal with, what? Well, cents per available seat mile being at about eight in terms of cost. SAS, of course, the one that's just filed for bankruptcy protection and seeing significant fuel cost pressure and then I'll add to that the labor costs where they of course seen the strikes that just added fuel to that fire air france also doing badly iag of course the yeah, owner of british airways seeing some of that pain and ryanair as well which is meant to be one of the budget carriers also having to deal with significant cost pressures but less so on the labor front but all of this just paints a picture of what a bind many of these airlines are currently in taylor 
Let's do more on that, Caroline, of course, on labor. Dante Harris, International Secretary Treasurer for the Association of Flight Attendants, I'm pleased to say is joining us now. And Dante, great to have you. Give us sort of just an overview of, of the shortage that you guys are facing this time around relative to years past. Yes, yeah, staffing cuts, uh, they were never returned uh, to pre-COVID levels. That's one of the biggest things that uh, are going on. Airlines are trying to grow so fast, and unfortunately, they can't hire fast enough. There's a lot of people that took voluntary leaves and voluntary separation packages, uh, and those packages ended up being permanent uh, solutions, and now it poses a huge problem. And Dante, tell us about your on-the-ground experience, because in addition to your role as treasurer, you're also currently a flight attendant for United Airlines. I mean, how does this moment in time compare to maybe the last two years or where we were, you know, at the start of the pandemic? Well, where we were at the start of the pandemic, everyone was very, very afraid of losing their job. Uh, we were in a situation that was unprecedented and no one knew exactly what was going to happen. So the airlines were essentially, um, they were essentially being as conservative as possible, making sure that they were able to uh, right size all the air, air, air uh, lines. They're trying to right size. We saw actually a lot of help being offered out to airlines overall from a, a sustainable basis. But I'm, I'm interested in what it's like serving people at the moment, Dante, because I was just on a flight, luckily, over from the UK to the US, and they were saying that actually we're, we're doing more with less, as many an in industry is doing, but also people are expecting more. They haven't traveled for a long time. They want, they're paying much higher prices. They want perfection, and that's really tough. Absolutely, and one of the things that you'll find is there are more seats more on, on more planes and less staff, uh, more passengers. And so that is one of the things that uh, you're all going to see when you travel. And the, the problem is that we need more staffing. The airlines need to properly staff in, in order to bring back the services that people are used to. Talk to us. It was interesting. We're having a conversation with an analyst earlier talking about some of the contract negotiations with the pilots, with the flight attendants, with United specifically, with other airlines as well. And again, of course, in the face of higher inflation, how you're thinking about some of the contract negotiations that you've been a part of, some of the pay raises, if it feels like enough, or if you guys are also feeling the way that the employer-employee relation has shifted sort of in this post-COVID world. Yeah, you know, we're back to a, a situation where travel is uh, ramping up big time. And we're back to a situation where all the airlines are, are most likely going to profit here in the United States. And so uh, a rising tide is supposed to lift all boats. And so that's why a lot of employees are expecting to share in some of the success that airlines are having right now with, with the increase in travel. And Dante, in your role as the treasurer for the Association of Flight Attendants, what is your top priority right now? Our top priority is to make sure that flight attendants are feeling safe. Uh, obviously, in the past few years, it hasn't been so good with regard to uh, disturbances on board airplanes, uh, with, with uh, flight attendants being assaulted. Uh, we want to make sure the airlines are taking the necessary steps to ensure uh, everyone has uh, self-defense training, a mandatory self-defense training. Mm. And also, we want to make sure that that um, uh, all these contracts get wrapped up. Really appreciate it. Your insights, of course, and all of that. Dante Harris from the Association of Flight Attendants. Really appreciate your time. We'll be back next with our final take. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg.
to the breaking news in the UK. Of course, two key resignations from the Cabinet, two people being filled. Nadim Zahawi is going to be the new Chancellor of the Exchequer. Steve Barclay is going to be Health Secretary and moving to replace the Education Secretary is Michelle Donnellan, of course, because Nadim Zahawi was the Education Secretary. Let's get to Ross Matheson, who's here with an update. What do you make of it all, Ross? Well, it's interesting to see how quickly uh, Boris Johnson has moved to replace these two very big holes in his cabinet, as you say, just announcing the replacement for the UK Chancellor and the Health Secretary, uh, wanting to get that done this evening rather than let people plot and plan perhaps overnight into tomorrow to try and put a stop on what could be a snowball effect where you see more ministers resigning perhaps later into the week. So it's trying to signal that he's moving quickly to regain control. He's putting uh, two of his key allies into these positions, but of course that could just be delaying what many people see as possibly the inevitable at this point, which is just the leeching of support for Boris Johnson, not just in the top ranks of the party, but across the, the broad swath of the party mm. in general. Just a YouGov poll out a short time ago showing that more Tories want him out than want him to stay, and that's the first time that that's happened in a poll like that. So certainly yeah. uh, lots of questions over his durability either way. Ross Matheson, staying up really late, almost 10 p.m. with you. We thank you so much. Now, from New York, we've covered all things airlines. We've got plenty to come from New York. And I'm about to do tech, but Taylor, what do you make of our <laughs> triple take? Really interesting when you think about just sort of the higher expenses that these airlines are going to face, maybe now in the face of recession. Absolutely. Fuel and labor, it seems like a bad mix. That's all from triple take. Bloomberg Tech is next. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>